The dumb out is a dude that's pretty thug style, but blow you out slug style. We come and fly, but we can get it popping too, don't get it confused. That's me and 50. We from the same situation. This is the story of the dumb out. Jamal Green, aka Maserati Fox, grew up in the West Side Merrick area of South Side Jamaica, Queens. Hailing from around the same parts 50 Cent came up, the two referred to each other as homies. In fact, he would unofficially get down with G-Unit in the mid-2000s, after being released from prison. He jumped in the streets at an early age. Allegedly, he got his name, Fox, when two men attempted to rob him for a chain. One of those men left with a buck 50. This is when someone gets cut from their ear, along the jawline, requiring 150 stitches to close the wound. That was the story. The Maserati part came from a studio session with 50 Cent for a track with Stack Bundles, who Fox had a close relationship with. 50 said something to the extent to of, Maserati Fox, fresh out the body shop, and he ran with the name. According to Fox, he once had 13 cars. Allegedly, 50 Cent put him on, trying to get him out of the streets, but also to serve as security, a shooter. Enough of the details though. Let's start from the beginning, and go back to the night of July 7, 1998, the night that would start a chain of events, related or unrelated, but would ultimately determine the fate of Maserati Fox. A taxi driver named Lloyd, picked up four men outside 11702 Foch Boulevard at approximately 10 o'clock in the evening on July 7, 1998. One of the four, Fox, approached Lloyd and asked him to take the men to 115th Street and Sutphin Boulevard. Fox got into the front of the cab. Shortly thereafter, the other three men exited a store and got into the back seat. One of the men in the back seat was A and A. As Lloyd was proceeding down Foch Boulevard, the men asked him to stop at building number 169, where one of the men got out of the cab. Fox, A and Day and the third man remained in the taxi. Lloyd continued to drive until he reached the intersection of Guy Brewer and Foch Boulevards, where Fox told him to pull over. Fox then exited the taxi and walked over to a couple of guys standing in front of 16311 Foch Boulevard. This building is located at Basley Projects. Although he could not hear what the men were saying, Lloyd could see Fox gesticulating, raising his hands above his shoulders and moving them from side to side. Apparently, he had been arguing with the men, because when he returned to the car, he told a and Day and the third man, Leon, that they violated him. That guy dissed me, pop that ninja. a and Day and Leon exited the taxi, armed with guns. Approximately 20 seconds later, gunshots started ringing out. Lloyd, the taxi driver, ducked down in his taxi for cover. He did not see who fired the shots, nor was he able to say how many shots were fired. The three men ran back to the taxi, Leon and Ayande, still armed. Fox again sat up front, and the Ayande and Jones sat in the back, after Lloyd drove off, he stopped at the light at Guy Brewer and Foch Boulevards. When he stopped, the Ayande put a gun to his head and said, drive, 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 before I pop you. Lloyd then went through the red light and turned left, onto 163rd Avenue. All three men exited the car, and Lloyd went home. At trial, Lloyd admitted that he first told the police that his girlfriend was using his cab on the night in question, and that he was at home sleeping when the shootings occurred, and had no knowledge of them. After the police spoke to his girlfriend, however, Lloyd was interviewed again, and related the events as he described at trial. Lloyd also testified that he knew Fox and a and Day from driving them on previous occasions, and that he identified each in a separate lineup prior to trial. Another dude, Hogan, testified that, on the night of the shooting, he was standing at the bottom of the hill near 16311 Foch with Etheridge, when he was approached by the three men. At this point, Curtis Scott was walking down the hill. At some point, Fox slapped Hogan, and then told Leon and a and Day to kill everybody, after which Hogan heard gunshots. Hogan then ran from the scene and, although he did not see anything further, he did hear screaming. When he reached home, Hogan called 911, then went back outside and saw Curtis Scott lying on the ground. Jamel, aka Mel, Curtis Scott's brother, also testified at trial. He testified that he was inside 16311 Foch when he heard three shots. He then came out of the building and saw his brother Curtis lying on the ground and A&A standing approximately one foot away with a gun in his hand. At that point, Jamel Scott heard Fox say, get Mel, at which point A&A fired two or three shots at him. Mel further testified that he saw Leon shoot at Etheridge. 
Finally, Mel stated that he returned to tend to his brother once Fox, Leon and Ayande had gone. Paramedic Guy Caprico testified that, when he turned Curtis Scott over to examine him, there was a silver gun positioned between Curtis Scott's right arm and his chest. A 380 bullet was recovered from Etheridge's chest as well. From this point, he would do an eight years in prison, five in the state and three in the feds. It was all in relation to the murder and other charges such as money laundering. He was never convicted of murder, but was convicted of criminal possession of a weapon in 2001 and sentenced to four years in prison. According to Smurf, Fox snitched and wrote a statement. Whether it's true or not, asked Smurf. They both have their ties 50 and had their beefs. We will get back to that later. During his first stint, Fox was in federal custody. During that time, he would encounter Peter Rollick, aka Pistol Pete. They would be bunkies in a high classification cell. There, Pistol Pete would explain to Fox that Pete's blood set, sex money murder, was headed toward bad standing. Pete said that his crew was triple nine, meaning they were cooperating against him. On Fox's way downstate he hit Metropolitan Detention Center in Brooklyn, where he would put on under the sex money flag, banging for the set. He came home around 05. Allegedly, he would get shot at during a dice game by two known street guys. Street say it was a misunderstanding, and some say it never happened. He would soon get linked up with 50 and had his connections with stack bundles and the riot squad. He and others were establishing the dumb out label, gaining a rising fan base in the south. As a result of the 50 cent affiliation, he would have back and forth spats with other street rapper guys, like Domination, Rich De Niro and Smurf. During the DVD and world star hip hop era, he did many interviews giving insight to his life and ongoing beefs in the street. He would diss Rick Ross and Young Dice, also from Queens, as Rick Ross and 50 Cent were going at it. The beef with Domination was squashed privately, but just to mention, both sides were armed with guns. Domination, who was also affiliated with 50 Cent before a fallout, would end up catching a manslaughter charge not too long after. He was offered a seven-year plea, which he didn't accept, landing him 18 years. There was also a beef with him and Lord Tyreek, a bunch of stuff. He mentions Max B, Young Jeezy, a lot of people. He was pretty entertaining, check out his interviews. As for Fox though, he would have the young flamboyant, Gregory, aka, G-Baby, along with him during interviews. G-Baby, harbored Thompkins projects in Brooklyn, and was also signed to Get Low Records, Memphis Bleak's label. Between 2006 and 2007, he was one of seven blood members trafficking $2 million worth of cocaine and heroin through Blair County. At approximately 4.30 a.m. on March 13, 2010, Gregory G. Baby Brown, 22, was shot and killed on the corner of Archer Avenue and 143rd Street. It happened just blocks away from Amazura nightclub, where the rapper was headlining a Fabulous concert. Rumors surfaced that the rapper, Fabulous, was responsible for G. Baby's death because of an alleged rivalry between the two artists. Don't know if that is true, the only connection is the rumored female, who was dealing with Fabulous and Maserati Fox. This seemed to be common with Fox, as it is also alleged that his fallout with G-Unit was in part because of Pillow talking with a female. Anyway, G-Baby was headlining the Fabulous concert. A 24-year-old Queens man, who asked for his name, to be withheld out of fear for his safety, said he walked out of Club Amazura with G-Baby, while laying Fabulous's luxury van. Gunfire came out of nowhere. There was a whole bunch of people on the corner, like 10 people, he said, recalling the shooting. G-Baby was next to me. When I turned around, I got hit. I heard four shots. G-Baby ran. They started shooting at him. They were targeting him, he said. G-Baby was found with three bullet wounds in his back. The street was packed with partygoers and cops, leaving the wounded man wondering how the gunman got away without a trace. A regular person couldn't pull that off, he said, adding that he didn't see the shooter. G-Baby collapsed in front of Fabulous's van, police said. Club bouncers moved G-Baby's body away, so Fabulous and his entourage could drive away. G-Baby was pronounced dead at Jamaica Hospital. The wounded man said he drove himself to Jamaica Hospital. Afterward, industry heads gave their condolences, such as Memphis Bleak, Nicky Munnage, Tony Yeo, Lloyd Banks, and even Fabulous. To this day, the murder is unsolved. G-Baby's moms said her 27-year-old nephew was attacked on Linden Boulevard by the man she believes shot her son. 
it was following that attack that her nephew called her to tell her that he had learned through word of mouth that the suspect is known as the shooter in the community. He said the guy meant to kill some other guy that goes by the name G-Baby, said Ms. Brown. The man was given G-Baby's address by a woman who was seeking a different person, and when the suspect found out that he had killed the wrong person, he allegedly shot the woman in the face. Brown has the names of all parties involved. For her safety, she declined to share them. However way it went down, that was the end for G-Baby. Fox would be incarcerated again in 2011 on an attempted assault conviction. Tragically, while locked up, his stepdaughter passed away. The death of Deasia Robinson was a tragic and senseless murder. The 14-year-old was a talented teenager with a bright future before her. The teen, who attended Campus Magnet High School in Cambria Heights, had just left a Sweet 16 party on May 18, 2013, and was riding the Q6 bus with friends when a stray bullet hit her in the head on Sutphin Boulevard, near Basley Pond Park. Shamel Capers was only 15 himself that night, and eager to settle a Facebook beef with a rival gang member, when he began squeezing off shots at the passing Q6 bus. Kevin, 21 at the time, also took his turn, to shoot the same 40 cal into the bus. Allegedly, someone on the bus flashed gang signs. Kevin was already somewhat of a reputed gang member, and got 40 years. Shamel got 15 years. Rapper 50 Cent says he sprung for the horse and carriage that carried the casket of slain 14-year-old Deasia Robinson at her funeral. People always try and paint negative images about me, I'm the most genuine down-to-earth person and I didn't forget where I came from. I came through for baby girl by providing a horse and carriage for her. She was pretty, innocent and didn't deserve to die like that. R.I.P. He was freed again on December 20, 2013, two weeks before he was killed. The arrested man, Jamal Scott, a.k.a. Mel. When Mel was 12 years old, his best friend, Danelle Porter, also only 12, was kidnapped, held for ransom for nearly a month. During his captivity, Danelle was tortured, mutilated and eventually murdered by the infamous Preacher Crew, which was headed by Clarence Heatley. This group over a period of nearly a decade was responsible for over a dozen murders, as well as dozens of kidnappings and robberies in Queens, Harlem and the Bronx. Danelle's own uncle, John Porter, an associate of the crew, assisted them in planning and carrying out this awful offense. This unspeakable crime was widely reported in the media for weeks. It was many months from the time Donnell was abducted before his body was found in a swamp near Co-op City in the Bronx. Donnell murder was followed in short order by the murder of his older brother Rich Porter, a high-level drug dealer who was being extorted by the Preacher crew. During his captivity Donnell was tortured and had a finger cut off and sent to his family, along with a tape of Donnell pleading for his life. Over the next years, Mel would lose more people close to him. By 1998, his older brother Curtis was shot and killed. This was the first story we spoke about when Etheridge was shot in the chest and Mel was shot at by Fox's crew. Even before the death of his brother, Mel was involved in the streets. He had 10 prior arrested dating back to 1996 for drug charges. He would catch a gun charge along with Etheridge in 2005. Now, here it is, 16 years later, Scott, of Jamaica, Queens, was being charged with second-degree murder and four counts of attempted murder and felony assault. Allegedly, the victims, including Fox, were in a Nissan Rogue that had stopped at a stop sign at the corner of 134th Avenue and Farmers Boulevard in Springfield Gardens, Queens. Around 4 p.m. on January 3, 2014, Mel and a second suspect walked up to the passenger side and opened fire. One of the vehicle's passengers, a 22-year-old man, was hit in the neck and shoulder and was in critical condition. The remaining passengers, another 22-year-old man and a woman in her 20s believed to be Fox's daughter, suffered a gunshot in the arm and a graze wound to the neck respectively. The driver was unharmed. As for Fox, he was hit. He stumbled out of the ride and died on a snow-covered driveway at Farmers Boulevard. The gunman, in all black and ski masked up, fled in a dark Hyundai sedan. Jamel Scott was facing murder and was arrested the following month. The murder charges were eventually dropped against him. How did this happen? Well, a key witness at the police coerced her into falsely testifying against him. The Queen's district attorney dismissed the case. Mel had spent two years in prison for the shooting.
Although Brockington and other witnesses initially said the gunman was wearing a mask, Brockington changed her story and identified Scott as the killer, according to court records. But she changed her story again, insisting NYPD detectives coerced her into fingering Scott in a lineup under the threat they would report her to the city's administration for children's services, which would take her children, records showed. She ended up getting indicted for perjury. Investigators suspected that the shooting was in revenge for the 1998 murder. It was unclear if any officers faced disciplinary action. This pretty much wraps up the Maserati Fox story. Stay tuned for the next one. Stay low, and thanks for watching.